uh, certainly is uh, a blessed opportunity for us um, to think about uh, the great uh, challenge and the blessing uh, that God reveals to us in his word of um, leading uh, children. And it certainly is a, a blessing that we have an eternal father who looks at us uh, as his children, those uh, who have been able to be born of God by the Spirit, by the gospel, can call God our Father. And what a blessing that uh, we have a Father who loves us as much as he does, as sacrificially as he does, um, with such eternal um, uh, forgiveness and mercy and uh, a desire to fill us with his wisdom if we would simply trust him and walk in his ways. And the Bible speaks to this, of that uh, the idea of leading people to walk in a way that glorifies God, that is ultimately for our best and for our good, is something that is extremely challenging. Uh, being a good husband, being a good wife, being a good father, being a good mother, these are all things that are incredibly challenging. So they can be a little bit misleading in thinking that sometimes we have in our minds the idea that um, as our children are born into us, that there's just going to be this natural uh, uh, relationship, that, that everything just goes so smoothly, and then and, and naturally uh, there's not a hitch in it, and, and it just almost has this hallmark kind of quality ending of uh, everything just is so lovely and so uh, bright. And yes, th that is possible. Hopefully we recognize, but it's only through the gospel. Those kinds of ideals and those kinds of, of, of quality picture of life and, and interrelationship with family is only possible through the gospel. That's his point even in marriage. Notice how often he points to the way that Jesus sacrificed his life and encourages husbands to go to that image and encouraging all of us to recognize only unless... We allow ourselves uh, to die to the things of our fleshly impulses and our worldly influences. Can we be the kind of husbands we're capable of being? It's only through being reborn and being changed by the gospel. And even in that, certainly, we recognize that tug-of-war pro process. Paul himself said, it's a war. It is a war within our members of killing the selfish impulses, killing the self-centered mindset, killing the thoughts that are dominated by the principles of worldly wisdom and even our own sense of what we think or believe to be right versus accepting the wisdom and the instruction that God wants to lead us with. And that image carries over into parenthood. You know, all of this is really connected. And that's why it's such a beautiful uh, passage to look at as we see in the role of a wife and a husband can only be merged together in union and companionship and in harmony unless they are simply following the principles of the Savior. I love what he says there in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to... The Lord. In other words, this is your help. This is your guiding principle. Why? Because it's hard for wives to be subject to their husbands. It's not easy. Uh, any kind of submission is certainly, or, or trust, or uh, dependency is not easy. And it's the same thing for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. And he says, husbands, before you just rise to the church, I'm the head of the house. Make sure you look to Christ <laughs> as the head of that house. And being a proper leader is not easy. It's not easy. Notice in chapter 6, we carry this on in verses 1 through 4. Notice the instruction continues. Let Christ be the guiding principle because this is going to be a challenge for you. Verse 1, children have ch challenges. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment of the promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Overall, 
The principle is that being a father is a difficult and a challenging role. Just as being a child of God is not just an instantaneous process that just smoothly transitions and, and we just automatically become this uh, beautiful picture of God's obedient child. Neither is anything that we strive to do in this earth as we strive to let God lead us. It's challenging. It's difficult. And something that sometimes as fathers can be a little bit misled by sometimes how we look at fatherhood and how we approach being fathers. We need to recognize that the Bible confirms that, that being a success in business does not equal success at home. It's something totally, completely different. It's something I believe is something, especially for men and for fathers, we can struggle with this. Because often I think the temptation is for us as we approach our life in our business world or uh, the um, world of, uh, of our work and our, our, our livelihood, the things we ascribe to excel at, these things do not automatically translate into home. Oh, it is a totally, completely different system. Just give a case in point. A couple of individuals in the Bible who were successes in spiritual endeavors, but often struggled when it came to fatherhood. One of them was Eli. Eli was a success at running the temple, but unfortunately had troubles being a father. He had struggles. Eli could run the temple seamlessly, but when it came to his home, there were Issues that he had to grapple with. Notice in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13, it says, For I have told them that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity in which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Eli could run the temple, but he had trouble running the house. That success did not translate. David is another example. David ran the kingdom beautifully. But he often struggled with his children. One example is with Adonijah. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 1 and notice the description of David's relationship with his son as a father. We know David's track record as a king. We know, in fact, think about this, the, the relationship of how we look at Jesus. As brother, he sits on the throne of David. He ran the kingdom so excellently, so marvelously, a picture of Jesus. But that success on the throne often did not translate into the home. But notice we read that in 1 Kings chapter 1. Notice the problems that David struggled with. 1 Kings chapter 1. I want to read the, just the first few verses in this opening chapter. 1 Kings chapter 1. Notice verse 5. It says, Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with 50 men to run before him. His father had never crossed him at any time by asking, why have you done so? And he was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. Words, David, even as a father, had trouble creating boundaries for his son Adonijah. And that resulted in his rebelliousness and his nature. David was a success on the throne, but sometimes struggled when it came to how the family is running, how, what it is that God is training us to be. And I believe one of the reasons for this and one of the things that we want to focus our attention together with fatherhood is to recognize that to be a father is to be a shepherd. And this is a very distinct God-centered role that often is not the business model, is not the worldly model of, of leadership. It is a spiritual model. This is what God calls fathers to be in their homes, is to be ultimately shepherds. And, and certainly we recognize the correlation with that because as we see uh, the way that God has designed the church to thrive and to uh, develop where do our shepherds come from they come from those who have had that experience of being trained to be shepherds in their home because that's what a father is being called to be 
Not necessarily a, a corporate success at home where he may very well be. He may very well be able to run the things at the office and run the things uh, in your business or run the things in your career. And often sometimes that can be the challenge of wanting to mingle that concept and bring it to home when no, you are called to be specifically a shepherd. As we look at Jesus, Jesus, the ultimate shepherd, I want to take a couple examples from him. And I wanted to go to John, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, where Jesus describes his role as a shepherd. And we, there are two key points we want to look at and just focus our attention on this morning. One in John chapter 10, he describes the work that he does as a shepherd. He says he is the good shepherd. And Jesus, of course, being the chief shepherd, is calling men to be shepherds over the spiritual house of God. And as we recognize before, as we look at 1 Timothy and Titus, we recognize that that training ground comes from the relationship that they have in their home with their wife, with their children, with being the, able to model themselves after the pattern of God. And notice here in John chapter 10, verse 1, we see Jesus describe his role as a shepherd. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. A shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens. And notice, here we have obedience. Jesus describes the correlation of the relationship he has with his children uh, God's children, his fellow heirs. He says he opens the door and gladly the sheep follow. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. Notice verse 7. It says, So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And is this not the goal of every father? To be the dominating voice in a world where all kinds of voices are competing for our children's attention. That describes perfectly the role of the father to be the dominating, trusted, leading voice in the realm of the children. And we recognize we're not the only grown up or adult or individual in their lives, a variety of people that they're being influenced by, potentially influenced by. Notice what a perfect example of Jesus to say, I have a relationship with my sheep in such a way they listen to me, not others. They listen to me and not others. That's the role, that's the goal of fatherhood. And Jesus sets it, he says, as a shepherd, you can have that relationship with your children. Because shepherds have a very unique, specific, intimate relationship with their sheep. And that they recognize the wide variety of the various nature of their sheep. They recognize one sheep is not exactly like the others. And that's the difference is sometimes we can do that, you know, and in, in, in we do that in, in a worldly sense, production. In, in business production and in, in things of, of earthly matters. Sometimes we, we have a certain standard and all things have to meet to that standard and everything that doesn't meet to that standard has certain ways that we change it and we alter it to make sure everything is uniform. That cannot be how a shepherd looks at his household because each one is so uniquely different. Hence why the shepherd is the ultimate example. And notice what he says there in verse 9. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He will be safe. There's this trusting relationship between children and the fathers. 
that they recognize that they have such a trusting relationship with the Father that they know that he is after their ultimate good and that ultimately they will find safety. Notice verse 13. It says, he flees because he is a hired hand and he's not concerned about the sheep. Notice verse 14. I am the good shepherd and I know my voice or I, I know my own and my own know me even as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Did you catch that? Did you catch how Jesus immediately goes from the shepherd relationship to what relationship? There's a reason for that. Jesus establishes, we want to mimic the relationship that Jesus has with his own father. Fathers, let's be shepherds. Let's follow that role model. Because that's the role model Jesus took. And he took it from the relationship he had with his own father. He said, my father is a shepherd. A shepherd that David, as we'll look at in a, in a moment, recognized as how God looked at him. So this is key. This is key, that we look at the home the way that a shepherd would look at sheep. Notice verse 15 says, Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd." For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commitment I received from my Father. I just want to simply talk about two points that come from this idea of shepherd fatherhood that I want to challenge and encourage all of us as fathers to adopt. One of those is to be a good shepherd with our children. We must know our children. We must know our children, and to know is to accept. Now that's the challenge, because no doubt, as fathers, we have certain ideas of what we want our children to be, what we want our children to develop, what we want children to learn. And one of the key points that we learn from our eternal father is that our father has an amazing ability to lead us to Develop the spiritual qualities of our Father while keeping our personalities and our individual quirkiness and, and just the, 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 the differences that we have intact. God is not interested in changing the way we were created. And we're all created very, very differently. We all have different pursuits and different interests and different just knee-jerk reactions to to uh, uh, pressure situations, to tempting situations, to um, exciting situations. And a lot of times how we act and behave is a revelation of what is actually what God himself has put in us. And Jesus says he knows his sheep. And by knowing it, he takes a great interest to understand that sheep so he can individually mold with keeping and understanding how these things work, and how these things operate. And the key to this is, again, is go back a few verses, and we'll see how this uh, 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 connects. Go back to the first five verses. How can we be sure that when Jesus says, I know my sheep, it's about understanding his sheep? It's because only by understanding sheep can you communicate effectively to your sheep. Because when you understand how your sheep works, you'll know how to individually talk to that sheep. And guess what? The sheep hears. There is a, a recognition of, I understand what you're saying. But sometimes we have a hard time, right, effectively communicating. <laughs> Which is why we need to look to the Lord's pattern for this. Because ultimately this is about communicating with our children. And fathers, men... In general, that's ultimately not, not usually our strong suit, communication. You know, we were we spent uh, the day yesterday, a beautiful day in in uh, Swallow Falls, Maryland. I remember when we were gone the way that I kept asking, "Is it is, is it uh, Swallow Falls? Is that the fictional location of uh, the, the movie Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs?" We looked at it. It is. 
kind of ironic because there was a cloudy day and I ate a meatball sandwich, but I, I don't know if that's <laughs> the way it's done. <laughs> but, I, but, but, but I couldn't help but think as I was thinking about the principles of this lesson that Jesus, Jesus first, knowing sheep means to understand how they act. Under, each one is different. And he knows specifically each one. And by knowing, he communicates to each one on an individual basis where they understand and they hear. One of the key, one of the great setups of that great movie is a, it's a great movie. It all is about father-son relationships. And, and, and the son is having this lament. He says, my mother, she just got me. She understood me. But dad, he... He, he, he has the family business with fishing, and, and he has this great dream that I'll be in the family fishing business. And all throughout the movie, the, the father's trying to communicate with the son. He keeps using fishing metaphors. And the son, almost at one point, he says, Dad, I don't understand fishing metaphors. There's a beautiful scene at the end of the movie where as they're dealing with that disconnect, that sense of, I, I don't understand you and you don't understand me, and trying to meet somewhere in the middle where the son, where the father is accepting his son has his ambitions of being a creator, a scientist, uh, being able to use these skills that, that often they don't translate to the fishing world. And trying to comfort his son, he holds up his lab coat, which he had been so attached to as a sign of his ambition. He says, son, what do we do when it rains? Put on a coat. That scene is exactly what Jesus is saying about the relationship between him and his sheep. He knows his sheep. And by knowing is accepting. There's a tendency, especially as fathers, we have these ideas, these ambitions, and we want our children often to share and have the exact same mindset. It, it, it just naturally happens. And that's the challenge I face as a father, that we all will face as fathers. Because in the business, in the, in the worldly scheme, what do we, when we think about duplication, we're thinking about imitation. I'm going to make another one of these. I'm going to produce one of these. And, and this line will continue. Well, in the spiritual realm, in the shepherd's world, even though, yes, they all have the same DNA and they all have the same wool and they all have the same essential makeup, they're all different. And that's what he's saying. And we will have this challenge. But I want to look at how David himself helps us understand how God was able to do this. I want to look at three simple points from the Psalm 23 that actually speak to this point. In Psalm 23 is David's relation to how his father, a shepherd, was able to speak to him. And how David heard his voice. And how he responded. And what he says is, first, this shepherd supplies, does not spoil. A shepherd supplies does not spoil. In other words, there's going to be often that, that temptation to simply satisfy the cries and the whims of, of the child who simply makes them happy. And there are times when it is appropriate, certainly, to, to provide those kinds of things. But in David's mindset, when he thinks about his father, the shepherd, he, he thinks back and he realizes, my shepherd father was constantly analyzing me, and, and by knowing me, he knew what I needed. Not what I maybe want him to have or, or I want him to develop, but what I needed as a sheep and in my individual way. But go back there to Psalm 23, and notice how this comes out. In Psalm 23, notice what he says. He says, the verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It was every need of mine is supplied. What need? The father's needs? No. And notice how the true shepherd recognizes that the sheep's needs are not always the same as the shepherd's. In fact, it's not going to be the same. 
And the only way we meet those needs is first understanding that and knowing that and being true to that and saying the job of the shepherd is first to know the sheep and to know they're not going to be the same as us. They're not because we were once sheep. We're still sheep, but we're not all the same. But that's, that's the challenge of parent because, again, we're, we're taught in so many other areas that that's where success comes from, duplication, imitation, and just repeat. Not, not in the home. And certainly not in, not in the church. But notice what it says here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In what way? In what way are you not wanting? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. What does that mean? It means the shepherd knows the sheep will only be peaceful unless certain criteria is met. I have to lead the sheep in green pastures. I have to find quiet waters. Is that what God needs? To, is God timid? Does God need safety around him before he settles down? No. But he looks at a sheep and he says, I know that that's what my sheep is like. And even though it's nothing like me, I will take that into account and I will speak in a way that meets that need. My sheep needs still waters. My sheep needs green pastures. And he knows that because he spends that time with the sheep and understands the makeup of that sheep. And it is an accepting knowledge. But again, that's the challenge because even as we accept, again, so that we were asked, well, aren't we as fathers supposed to teach? Aren't we supposed to make them something? They can't do that on their own. They need guidance. They need a vision. Yes. So let's move on to the second part. Because the second part cannot happen unless we first follow the first part. The first part is knowing, and by knowing, we supply what they need. Again, remember, their needs are not going to be our needs. It will be individually unique. So number two, not exasperating, but protecting. Not exasperating, but protecting. And it was, think back to that swallow fall scene. That was the exasperation, was that the father felt that the son needed something that was what met the father's needs. And it simply wasn't. But notice what it says here. In verse 3, it says, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Notice verse 4. Verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Words, we are often in danger because we don't have all the answers. Yes, that's the danger of childhood on its own without proper guidance. That's why we need fathers, because fathers have experience. Fathers have knowledge. Fathers know better. And here's a perfect example. Sometimes sheep wander and they get way too close to danger and they need a father to what to guard them to protect them to save them but again how jesus says it's by communicating what did he say he says i speak and my sheep hear this is crucial when we see our sheep in danger if we don't know how our sheep operates, if we don't understand the individual makeup of them and, and speak to that level of understanding how they respond, understanding how they re react, we can speak with all the greatest intentions, but if they don't hear us, it can't help them. What was that one of the major problems Jesus said about communication? Having ears don't hear. Sometimes that is the problem of the listener. Sometimes it's the problem of the communicator. Because we often don't look at it as a shepherd relationship. Because with shepherds, guess what? Most of the responsibility, 
Most of the accountability in terms of how is how's this going to work lies on the shepherd. It's an understanding nature. Remember, isn't that not what we just read in Ephesians chapter 5 about husbands? How do husbands lead their wives? By understanding the way Jesus understands his sheep. And fathers have to, have to look to that model. Sometimes that's where the exasperation comes from. Is that the father, with all the right answers, yes, all the right instruction, is communicating we almost demand well and the exasperation comes from the child and the exasperation comes from the father and oftentimes the father has put the responsibility on the child you need to figure this out no the father needs to figure this out needs to figure out how the sheep operates that's shepherding it is a sacrificial work of understanding how people respond to that kind of leadership. That's why Jesus says the only way this is going to work, not by going to what my father, my grandfather, no, but what the Jesus did. That's how we do this. And notice what he says. And notice, I love how the response. Notice what response is. When when shepherds communicate and effectively warn by knowing how their sheep will react or, or, or hear them, what's the result? The result is comfort. Notice verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they cover me. You know what this, this means? It means that this sheep... When it doesn't realize what it's doing and it's in danger and it's affecting its livelihood, that the shepherd communicates in such a way that the sheep looks up and says, I'm comforted because you understand where I'm at and I understand what you are trying to protect me from. I understand. I get it. I see it. That's what the shepherd is aiming for, is that when that needed rod of correction comes, the effective uh, communication process has been successful, and the result is they're comforted. And then the third part, not abandoning, but nurturing. Not abandoning, but nurturing. Sometimes we can do this. We can abandon, even though maybe we physically have not abandoned, but we have not, we have not provided what is essential. And this provision is a future provision. Notice this passage. What, is, what does he mean by this? He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. One of the most beautiful pictures of that whole relationship is of the, the shepherd pouring oil over the head of the sheep. A good shepherd recognizes there are vulnerabilities and there are weak spots that their sheep have. Namely the eyes and the nostrils. There's a larva that can sometimes go inside the nostril of a sheep. Playing all kinds of things, cause all kinds of Havoc and wreckage. Same thing with the eyes. Pouring oil is a preventative measure. In other words, that the shepherd knows his sheep so well, he knows its weak spots. And rather than having the school of hard knocks approach, I'm not saying there's not a time for tough love. I'm not saying there's not a time for you've got to figure this out. But it all, but it speaks to that willingness to instead of you're on your own you have to figure this out of i'm aware what your weaknesses and your vulnerabilities are and i'm doing things in preparation of that to make sure you develop correctly and without too much pressure on you so that these things are taken care of that's the idea he says he presents he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies that is the shepherd often goes to spots where he wants his sheep to bed down but he's gone there before Noting any potential place where, where a predator could hide, where a predator could, could lurk, and he tears down those places. 
he fills in holes and gaps when there's dangerous spots where they can fall. He understands the, the places where he's vulnerable. And with a sympathetic hand, the father is guiding. And what does he say? My cup overflows. When you have that kind of a trusting sheep child in your midst, when I can get to the place where I can, can try to have that kind of relationship, this is what we find in verse 6. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Is that not what we want for all of our children? Yes, that's what any godly father wants, to be able to say that our children will dwell in the house of our Lord forever. And we find success leading them there when we develop the hand of a shepherd. And again, that's not saying there's not a time for that tough love. In fact, that's what tough love is there with your rod and your staff. You notice the action. When a rod and a staff of correction are used effectively, knowing exactly how to communicate and knowing that they're going to reciprocate that communication, that's when you have comfort and not exasperation, bitterness, resentment. It's about the, uh, the understand what's going on. And again, as I've said before, <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> Kidding me? I know my weak spots as a father to instinctively get to that point of this is what I need you to do. This, this is what you have to do. And I'm your father. And to ask myself, how does a shepherd communicate these things to a sheep? Again, in those situations, often the responsibility, the accountability, the work falls on the shoulders of the Father to emulate those things that the Father teaches us. And prayerfully, we can find that place of balance, of godly help and instruction to have that kind of leading relationship with the sheep. And for anyone who's with us who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, Again, as we talk about these things, we're simply talking about the ultimate relationship that God has with you, what God wants with you. And as, as we sum all this up, doesn't this again echo what Jesus himself said? My burden is light. Come to me. Follow me. Be instructed by me. I'm gentle. In other words, you're... There's a great, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the Coke factory, but I always laugh because I, I don't know how you argue with the slogan. It's like, you're going to like the way you look. <laughs> it's like this confidence. <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying. I love the confidence. You're going to, you trust me, you're going to like the way this turns out. <laughs> it's what he's saying. He's saying, I, because I already know you, and I've already got this planned out in a way that speaks to you, that resonates with you, because I understand you. And I trust that you're going to understand where, my, where I'm trying to lead you to be like me, to be like our Father, and you're going to like how this turns out. Which is why David, in all those three points, says, I overflow with goodness. I rejoice. I'm comforted. My cup overflows. Because he's being led by a shepherd. And so we Encourage anyone who's with us that you would, you would you love to have that relationship. You can have that relationship with God, your Father. If you confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins, to die to all these sins and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. And to walk in newness of life in the leadership of a heavenly Father who says, I'm your shepherd and will lead you, will know you, will understand you, and will speak to you in a way that you can understand so that we can follow. Once you come to the front, if it is, the need is there for you to obey the gospel, won't you do that while we stand and sing the song of courage, but come to the front and obey the gospel while we stand and sing.